just in case. There we go. And then, yeah, whenever you'd like to start, I will enjoy seeing all the animals. Good deal. All right. Hi there. Um, my name is Dr. Dawn Manning. I am the education director here at Lichterman Nature Center and also a wildlife biologist. So I have studied um, the life cycles and adaptations of many, many different animals. Um, from Even from the pandas at the Memphis Zoo when they came in 03, um, they literally did come off a FedEx plane. It was really cool. But today we are gonna talk about reptiles and we're gonna talk about um, reptiles that are mostly native to the Southeastern United States. Native animals um, are supposed to be here. They weren't introduced um, like some other, like some other um, things that you've heard of being introduced here. Um, they have always been here and belong here. So let me tell you just a few things about reptiles before we get started. And I have a lot of cool artifacts to show you and I have uh, four live animals that are just really, really cool to talk about. So um, reptiles have a few things in common. They have scaly skin, they shed their skin, they shed their skin, um, they shed their skin periodically. Um, a snake will shed the whole body worth of skin. Lizard sheds off in little pieces. We actually um, do slough off our skin when we get out of the pool or out of the bathtub with the um, towel, but we don't uh, shed our skin like a reptile. Reptiles are also cold blooded. This means that they have to get under the sun or light for heat. They can't move or do their bodily functions without being um, basically heated up. So we don't have to do that as um, mammals, humans, because we are actually warm blooded, which we have an internal temperature keeper kind of in the inside that keeps our body at a nice 98.6. So when it gets cold, we can put a jacket on, not so um, much for the reptiles out there. Also reptiles always, always um, lay their eggs on land, even if they mostly live on the water. So um, in a minute, I'm gonna talk about a water turtle. And even though it lives all of its life in the water mostly or right near the water, it still lays its eggs on the land. So those are some characteristics of reptiles that um, all reptiles have in common. Now, as we go through the different species of reptiles, you'll see a lot of changes um, in the different types of reptiles that we have. So first of all, I want to talk about this. So you may have seen these. You may have seen these in the woods. You may have seen live one in your yard. This is a box turtle shell. So the Eastern box turtle is the state turtle of Tennessee, the state reptile, sorry, of Tennessee if you're ever on trivia. Now, I always ask, can, a rept can this turtle leave its body and find a prettier shell if wanted or needed? No, the answer is no, it cannot. You can see the very, very strong spine or backbone that's gonna hold that turtle in its shell for its whole entire lifetime. So what happens is the turtle actually, the shell actually grows with the turtle. This is a very long uh, lived species of reptile. These Eastern box turtles can live to be up to 50 to 75 years and um, have been noted to be upwards into a hundred years in captivity, meaning that they were um, kept by humans and taken care of. So, you may ask about scales on a turtle because it does have the hard shell. Um, they do have scales on their feet and their head and other places, but also they have these segments called scutes. You can see when I put that up very close, the segments of the shell are called scutes. Now these shed off periodically like our fingernails and others grow underneath to protect the turtle and it goes on about its business. So what's interesting about a box turtle is it can, we have a little um, stuffed animal here. So a box turtle is called a box turtle because it is able to pull all of its body parts into its shell. Oh, it's not wanting to. Pull all of its body parts into its shell. So it is all tucked in there. So, when you're looking at this, 
This top part is called the carapace. The bottom part here that would be here is called the plastron. So the plastron will close up around everything and you won't even be able to slide a blade of grass into that shell. It's also a great way to camouflage. You can see the coloring. This animal is dome shaped. It would live on the land under the trees. So it can blend in with leaf litter on the bottom of the forest floor, but also it looks somewhat like a rock. So if we are going through the forest and you were a predator such as a fox or raccoon, you would probably just skip right past this turtle because it would box in for protection and you would go on to try to find something tastier or something that was moving to eat. So very, very good um, camouflage and defense there. Um, I wanted to show you, this is a box turtle shell without the scoots. So after a while, all the scoots come off and you're left with a white shell. So this shell is completely bone, which is really cool. It's very hard, just it's like our bones, it's very hard. So you can see the difference in these two. This shell still has scoots or segments. This shell has lost all of its scoots over time as the turtle passed away and decomposed. So is the turtle shell free of the scoots, fox turtle shell? And if you were curious about fox turtle babies, turtles are only about this big. So if I put my finger beside it, you can see that that little turtle is only about the size of the tip of my finger. When they're born, they're even a little smaller. This turtle is a little, it's a baby, but it's a little bit older than the other two in that frame. So they grow and they grow and eventually become large box turtles. All right, so I think it's time to see the real thing. Scoot some things over there to Miss Amy. So, what I have here with me is an Eastern box turtle. I'm gonna see if I can get, get him in the frame here. So you can see him well, and then I'll try to um, uh, raise my camera down so we can see if he'll walk around for us. So we can see here that um, this turtle has a very hard shell, like we said, like we were talking about. And this is the carapace and the plastron underneath there. This is the part that would close in. The reason why he's not scared and he's not boxing in is because he's been handled by humans and lived in captivity since 2004. And I'll tell you that story a little later. So. I keep saying he, I know that this box turtle is a boy because he has red eyes. The boys always have red eyes in the Eastern box turtle or orange. The girls will have brown eyes. One of the differences there that you can tell in the males and females. Also, the males will have a scoop under on the plastron and this is for mating purposes. And you can see the scales on the legs the tail, the back legs. They do have claws for digging. And you can see his scales on his head there. So the Eastern box turtle is the state reptile of Tennessee. He moves pretty slow. Let me see if I can get us down, see if he will walk around at all. Let me look at you a little bit. But that's about all he's going to do. Um, he's very tame because he has lived here. Now, one interesting thing about box turtles, they don't live in a very large area. For their whole lifetime, they will live in an area that's not any bigger than a couple of square miles, maybe not even that big. So they always want to go back to where they're hatched. They always want to go home. So when you remove these as pets and they don't make good pets and it's actually illegal in Tennessee. 
to um, have one as a pet. I'm gonna move around a little now. Um, it's illegal in Tennessee to have one as a pet, but it's also very sad to keep one as a pet because they always wanna get back to where they were born. So they will keep walking and searching and searching for that place, no matter if that means crossing roads, if that means um, going across dangerous terrain, they'll always try to get back to where they hatch. They kind of have like an inner, an inner GPS kind of sense about it. So when you take them out of the wild, they're always gonna to try to get back to where they hatched, which happened to this one. So he was taken out of the wild and actually tried to sell as a pet. Someone tried to sell him as a pet and the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Authority actually caught them and said, no, you can't do that, that is illegal. Um, and we were able to keep him here at Lichterman. So this was in 2004. So that was a long time ago. Um, maybe um, even older than some of you, but he'll live here his whole life. And again, he can live 50 to 75 years. But if we released him, he wouldn't be scared of predators because he's been handled, but also he would always try to get back home. So when you see a box turtle and they're trying to cross the road, don't go out and move them back in the wrong direction. If you're gonna help a turtle, first you know, ask your parent or make sure it's safe on the road and move the turtle the same way it was headed or it will just turn back around and go the way it was going towards its home. So I'm going to put away our state reptile of Tennessee here and give him back to Miss Emmy and talk about another type of turtle that's a reptile. All turtles, are re all turtles are reptiles. I don't know why I said that. All right, so the next shell I have is a red-eared slider shell. Now, you can see this one is flatter and it's bigger than the box turtle shell. The reason it's flatter is this animal has an aerodynamic type of shape so it can swim in the water. This, this animal, this turtle, this red-eared slider is going to live in the water its, its whole lifetime. They're water turtles. So they have a system where the water goes through their shell and they can't box in. Um, they also have a really interesting way of camouflaging. So you can see on the top, it's very, very dark, kind of like the top of a murky pond. So that is camouflaging if you were a hawk or something that was trying to get a bite of the turtle, you might miss him and go for a fish beside instead. Now, on the other hand, this is the bottom or the plastron and it is lighter or more um, yellow on that side than the other. So this would allow for protection as well. If you were a large fish or an alligator maybe, and you were coming up out of the water, you might mistake this for the sun's rays coming down and go for something else that you could see better and leave this turtle alone. Now, they're very, very fast swimmers. Um, I always say, this is like the Lamborghini or the Corvette and that box turtle with the dome is like the minivan or the Volkswagen bug. This one is a lot faster, but it requires, this animal needs to be faster to get away from predators and to swim well in the water. So we can see the differences there. Now, that difference in shading or color is called counter shading. It means dark on one side and light on the other. Now he also has a backbone, all reptiles do. They're all vertebrates. He also has a backbone in there that attaches to his shell. I don't know if you can see that in there, try to hold that closer. Attaches um, also to, um, he also is attached to his shell his whole life and the shell grows with him. These turtles don't live quite as long as box turtles, but they can live to be about 25 or 30 years. Um, some people have started to get these as pets. I don't know if that is, a, is legal or illegal in Tennessee. I'll just say that um, these animals don't make awesome pets and they're very messy and need a lot of care and cleaning up after. But I do have the real thing to show you. So let me get him out and we'll put the shell away. 
So this guy is going to look a lot different than the box turtle that we just saw. He's going to have some different adaptations. And he is going to move a little bit more. So holding on to him is a little more difficult. So we can see on the side here, maybe I can get him to show us. You see those feet are webbed. So his webbed feet are used for him to swim well in the water. So that is one adaptation of the water turtle. Um, he has very long fingernails here in the front. You can see those well. Um, so this is funny. So he's a male and I know that because he has very long fingernails in the front on his front legs. The females have very long fingernails on their back legs because this will help them to um, later dig a nest and lay their eggs. So finally got him a little still here. We can look at some adaptations. So you can see the nails. You can see the webbed feet in the back. Also their um, nose is turned up like a snorkel. So they can be um, swimming through the water and just barely poke that head up out of the top to get some air and go right back down. He, can, he can't box down. You can see all the loose skin around him. And he can pull it in a little bit, but he can't box in to totally protect himself. Now, again, to these turtles being pets, and if it's legal, I'm not sure. Um, but these guys are one of the most invasive species and they are native to this area, but they are one of the most invasive species that lives in our ponds and lakes. These guys can reproduce so quickly that they have babies and babies and babies, and they can actually take over your pond ecosystem. Um, and it's also partly because people get these, pick them up when they're little, and then they think they'll be good pets, and then they actually do have to release them. Now here at Lichterman, we have these for various reasons. Most of um, those reasons are because it was illegal and people tried to sell them and so they got placed here. Excuse me, but I will say that these turtles get their tanks cleaned three times a week and they are never fed in the tank. They are taken out to be fed because they make such a terrible mess. Also, you have to be very careful, especially with water turtles because they can carry a bacteria known as salmonella that can make you sick um, if you put your fingers in your mouth or come in contact with it that way. Now, let me see if he will walk around. He may run off the table. Let's see, we got a Miss Emmy over here to help us, but we'll see if I can get him in the shot here. He may press the buttons. Yeah, he's going all on the screen for you. He's just showing off. And we're gonna let him walk right off that table and Miss Emmy is going to grab him gently and put him back up so we can talk about another, well, another species of reptile. Sorry about that camera moving, but I want you to see the animals really well and it's a little trickier with live animals. All right, so now we're gonna talk about an animal that not as people maybe don't love like the turtles or think that's quite as cute as the turtles, but they're very, very important. And this is a snake. So snakes actually have a lot of cool adaptations, but one thing they do for us is they eat mice. So snakes eat a lot of mice, keeping the mice away from us. And they um, do a really good job at it. Now, I wanna tell you just some characteristics about the snake, and I actually do have a live snake to show you and talk about venomous versus non-venomous and things like that. So snakes have scales, and if they are a non-venomous snake, like most of ours here in Tennessee, his head is shaped like this. So like you can give a thumbs up. Also, the eyeballs are round like ours. Not that you wanna get so close to a snake to see that, but if you had some nice binoculars, you could look on the ground and see what the eyeballs looked like. 
And then interestingly enough, and we're gonna, um, this is part of our activity later at the end, so we'll learn a little bit more. Interestingly enough, um, with the thumb-shaped head and the round eyeballs, if you look underneath the um, tail of the snake, the underneath scales, the underneath scales will actually come down on the non-venomous snake and then part out like this. So they're not straight, they're segmented. This part right here would be where the cloaca is. So snakes, um, snakes get rid of wastes a lot like, um, snakes get rid of waste like birds. So everything comes out of one area, which is the cloaca. So this is the underneath part of the tail. And um, this is how the scales um, happen on there. So you've got non-venomous right here. And then we've got venomous. So a venomous snake is gonna have a head shaped more like a diamond or a triangle. And that is true here in Tennessee. Um, their eyeballs are also going to be slits, kind of like cat eyes, not round eyeballs. And then if you look on the bottom of their tail, they are gonna have a different scale pattern than the non-venomous. So their scale pattern is gonna be straight across cloaca right there, straight across scales, venomous, non-venomous. And we'll talk some more about that later. So snakes do shed their, oh, let me show you this first. So this is one venomous snake that we do see in Tennessee. This is just a mount. We don't handle um, venomous snakes here at Lichterman. So there's a few venomous snakes here in Tennessee that we do see more of than others. This is one of them, and this is a copperhead. So these animals like to live under trees. Um, they're kind of elusive. They don't like to be bothered much. Um, you may see one, but it's not going to chase you. It's not going to do anything like that. Um, most people get bitten by snakes because they step on them. So this is a venomous copperhead, and you can see the shape of his head. Let's see, sorry. The shape of his head is really thick, not like your thumb, more like a diamond. The other snake that we have here in Tennessee that is uh, venomous is the water moccasin. Those snakes live closer to the water, of course, and um, are really very dark in color and a little bit more aggressive than the copperhead. Now, the difference between venomous and non-venomous snakes, non-venomous snakes actually have their teeth, they're constrictors. So they'll wrap around their prey and their teeth actually are pointed backwards in their mouth. So when they wrap around the prey, they squeeze the prey um, till it's not living. And then they shove that mouse back into the back of their mouth. Now, if they have venom and they're a venomous snake with this shaped head, they are going to strike with things and insert venom into the prey. Snakes also shed their skin, much different than turtles. So this is snake shed, I believe from our um, corn snake that we have in our lab here. Um, you can see that the shed is from head to tail. This is a pretty intact piece. Um, we let students feel this so that they can see what a snake shed feels like. Um, you could find these in your yard after snakes have shed. They'll look for um, rocks and different logs and things like that um, to rub on or concrete or bricks. So they can get off the um, skin, get off their skin and shed it. Now that is because reptiles are always growing, so they must shed their skin so they can grow more and get bigger. Now, we already talked about a snake having a backbone, but you may be surprised to see that the backbone actually goes from head to tail. Very, very strong backbone with a lot of little ribs there on the side. And so when you handle snakes, you have to be careful to not squeeze them because you don't want to harm those little ribs. And so I'm gonna get out the real thing and um, I'll just need this for the activity. 
I'm gonna get out the real thing now and we'll look at some of, of her adaptations. in the box. Oh, he's pretty. Okay, so I have here a corn snake. So let me take off my watch so he doesn't get strung up in there. So this is a corn snake. Now he's a beautiful snake. Um, he is non-venomous. We can see by his head. We can give him a thumbs up right there. He doesn't like that so much. Now he's sticking out his tongue. Um, he's not saying nanny nanny boo boo. He's actually smelling and tasting the air to see if there are any mice or anything like that nearby that he might want to eat. Now he's got a forked tongue with a special gland called a Jacobson's gland that alerts him to heat where prey is. So if his tongue's like this, if he feels something this way, he'll move this way. If he smells something this way, he'll move this way now or taste something. Now he also has nostrils because he does have lungs. Those are hard to see up at the front. Um, he does not have any ears. We adjust here. See if we can get a good one of the head. He does not have any ears. Um, snakes do not have ears. They have a tympanic membrane right there where ears would be. So they um, don't hear as loudly as we do. They feel vibrations. So he can sort of hear what I'm saying right now, but um, I mean, he can't hear what he can. It's a muffled sound, like if you put your um, hands over your ears and talked. That is how the snake would be hearing, um, would be hearing you. So also interestingly enough about snakes, they cannot close their eyes. So you do not know if they are sleeping or awake. So you have to be careful with snakes, but you never wanna pick up animals in the wild that are wild animals because they could always bite you, even though he is non-venomous he could always still try to bite and it doesn't feel great. Now, you may ask, why is this called a corn snake? Well, it does not eat corn. Um, it does not eat corn, but its name came around, along because um, a, a farmer that was growing crops um, saw these snakes in his field and knew that they were eating the mice. Well, the farmer liked that idea because it was saving him a lot of money on growing and he had um, a lot of more return, more returns than he would have without the snakes. So the snakes are eating all the mice in the grain fields and the corn fields, which is also saving us money when we're buying grain and corn and cereal, saving us money because the mice aren't eating the, um, aren't eating the grain the snakes are eating the mice in the grain field. Now, he does have lungs. He has all the body parts that we do. They run down his body. Um, his coloration is such that he would um, camouflage in a cornfield. And some people, when I turn him over, think that this looks like the kind of corn that you can get for decorations at Halloween. And so maybe another reason for that common name, corn snake. Now he's also a constrictor, which means he would wrap, and he's not going to, but he would wrap around his prey, squeeze it, and then shove it back in his mouth um, with um, those teeth that are actually pointed backwards in his mouth. Now he can eat a, a mouse or rodent as big as, bigger than his head actually, because he can open up his jaw and unhinge it just like this. So really cool, cool adaptations. These animals again are cold blooded, so they need the sun to perform all of their bodily functions daily and to move. So when the weather gets cold, these animals do hibernate. When reptiles hibernate, it's called brumation. 
So this guy would go underground in a tree, under rocks, find a good place to hide for the winter, stay there, not move at all. His breathing and bodily functions and um, all of his systems would uh, would just, you know, not, not, not work, kind of like um, a bear in hibernation, just slow down. And he would brumate or stay there until it warmed up in the spring to come out. And um, of course, snakes do lay eggs. And this corn snake um, does indeed lay eggs. Now, let me see if I can show you the bottom of the tail scales. They're harder to see. That's why we have the picture. But here's the cloaca, and you can see his scales are have a line and then each um, divided on each side and not straight across. So that's a reason, again, that I know he is um, non-venomous. Let me see if he'll move around for us a little bit, get your close up. Now, he is very, very large. The snake is um, probably about five feet long um, and probably will not get any longer than that, but just thicker. Um, he's going towards me because I'm warm, because I'm warm blooded and uh, he is headed to get warm. So we're gonna um, give him back to Miss Emmy and talk about um, the last couple of species that we have here. A good close up of, you stick your tongue out for him. All right, thank you. Okay. So another reptile that is native to the um, southeastern United States is the alligator. So this is an alligator skull. Um, skulls protect our brain. He has eyes in the front, which tells me he's a predator. Eyes in the front, we say must go and hunt. Predator species, eyes in the front, must go and hunt. Um, now his brain will be protected here. And you can see these massive teeth. So this animal is a carnivore. It only eats meat, a lot of different varieties of small mammals, fish, other things like that. Um, it's a really bad idea. Some people have started to introduce these into their ponds and lakes in uh, Tennessee. They can be dangerous. Get up to be 16 feet long and um, very, very large, very, very large, powerful animal. Now, the alligator is different from the crocodile because we don't have um, crocodiles here in eastern, uh, south, the southeast, but the alligator is going to have a rounded snout with the teeth that have an overbite. But if he was a crocodile, he would have a snout that was more pointed and his teeth would be like an underbite. So that would be the differences there. Now, alligators also have very, very thick skin and scales like this. So I just have a piece here of alligator skin so that you can see what that looks like. It does shed off. You can see the scales look different than they did on the snake. They're a little bit rougher, a little bit more protection for that alligator um, from, for the sun and other reasons like that. All right, so the last animal I have for you is very cool. Um, first, I'll give you a hint and show you skeleton. So it kind of looks like a snake with legs, which is sort of correct. This is a lizard. So the lizard, also a vertebrate. You can see the backbone here, um, head to tail, and the legs. Lizards have legs, snakes don't. Lizards also have ear holes, which snakes don't, and they can close their eyelids. So we are gonna look at a blue-tongued skink, which is not native to Tennessee, um, but is one of our education animals we have here at Lichterman. So, I won't show you those yet. So let me get him out. He is very calm and large. Let's see there. Okay. okay. 
All right. So everybody can get a close up here. So you can see right there on the side of his head, those holes, which people mistake and think they're gills, but he doesn't live underwater. Those are his ears. So as a snake does not have ears, a lizard does and can hear quite well. So those are his ears right there. He does have nostrils here in the front. You can see very close. Um, so he, he does have lungs just like us. He breathes, he breathes in oxygen. Um, he does have strong jaws. He's very tame. Um, he's lived here for a very long time. These animals you can, you can own as pets here in Tennessee, but they are a long lived lizard. So he is already 15, 16, and he could live to be 25. So you have to take that into account when you are um, thinking about owning reptiles. So this is a blue tongue skink, and I don't know, I can't make him. Everybody asked me if he will stick out his blue tongue. He sticks out a blue tongue, and I have some pictures of it as well. Oh, there he goes. Um, he sticks out the tip of that blue tongue um, frequently. Now, if he were in Australia, that would be a kind of a warning to get away from him because he has a blue tongue, it's bright, it's scary. Um, don't, you know, if a dingo came up, don't get near me. Um, I'm gonna stick out my blue tongue. Now, I wanna show you a picture though, because you're just seeing the tip of that tongue. I wanna to show you a picture or a few pictures of blue tongue skinks in the wild because they have a huge tongue. He's just showing you the tip. So here is the face and you can see that huge tongue sticking out there, that big blob of blue. Here's another one. You can see that large tongue. And then there's another one of a very mad wild blue tongue skink. So that is their main mode of protection is that blue tongue. Now, if you see back here, we've got him positioned so everybody can see and he's, oh, he's in the frame. Um, so he is about two feet long and he's got a tail back here. So when he were younger or possibly now, um, if he got really scared, he wouldn't get scared enough to do this today. But say if he were in Australia in the desert and um, a wild dog or dingo ran up, he would try to, he would release the tail. The tail would wiggle behind him and he would hope that the dingo would come after his tail and let the rest of him run away. So that is another defense mechanism. Um, skinks are, are lizards, but they are a class of lizard that's a little bit different. So this lizard is a skink again. He has short legs, he moves low to the ground. So a lot of people think that he is a snake and he stays, to, stays on the ground mostly. Now they can climb up the side of buildings a little bit, but they're not gonna climb on trees um, like regular lizards um, <coughs> or anoles or anything like that because they don't have the um, legs, the climbing legs. So they have these little bitty feet that stick out on the side and I'll pick them up and you can see how they just stick out. And he does look, sorry. He does look kind of scary, but he's actually very docile. And um, I still would never pick one of these up in the wild, but, um, but yeah, he's, he's a very docile guy and his scales again are harder than a um, more, or sorry, more protective and rougher and harder than a snake because he was a desert animal and would need that protection from the sun. Um, also, he is a burrowing animal. So in the Australian desert, he would burrow down into the sand and um, wait for it to rain and then come up uh, possibly come up for um, a snail or something like that, that um, kind of struck his fancy. Um, so that is our blue tongue skink.
Very cool animal. Again, not native to Tennessee. We do have skinks, but they're not nearly this big. Um, <laughs> there may be six inches from head to tail. And um, you can see those. We have broadhead skinks, five line skinks, uh, four or five different species of skinks here in Tennessee, but none that get this large. Now, again, different than a snake, he can blink his eyelids so you know when he's sleeping. He's got ear holes, which a snake does not. He's got legs, which a snake does not. And both and all the snake and the lizard and all reptiles have lungs and nostrils and breathe through those. So that is my lizard friend. And I'm going to give him back to Miss Emmy reluctantly. Um, he is one of our favorites here at Lichter. So we are going to go through a little activity together and it won't take long. So everybody get out their supplies. Um, from your supplies, you will need a marker, marker or a crayon. And um, the supplies that were delivered, you have Oh, sorry, you have a sheet of green paper with a hole in it for your head, a sheet of green paper for your, and with a hole in it for your snake tail. We are going to make a non venomous snake out of Fruit Loops. Now you have a bag of Fruit Loops. I actually have these because I ran out of Fruit Loops. So you're going to get your Fruit Loops out. Your snake um, may look different. <laughs> Each snake is probably going to look different um, as far as you want to, um, to make the colors and the pattern. So we know that the non-venomous snake is the shape of the thumb. So I'm going to go ahead and draw one here with my hole punch this way. I'm going to draw my snake head like that, my non-venomous snake head. So I've got my non-venomous snake head here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and give my non-venomous snake his very round eyeballs there. Very round eyeballs there. And then maybe a forked tongue as well. So I'm going to cut this, my head out. My little tongue. There we go. And now I have my non-venomous snake head with the round eyeballs, the thumb-shaped head, and a um, little too forked tongue there. So with my other sheet of paper, I'm going to draw my non-venomous snake tail, which looks like this. So um, I'm going to draw, start at this end where my Pull punches. I'm going to make an easy looking tail. Not quite an artist, I am. All right, so just like this. And then I'm going to start, I'm going to make my cloaca. Which is the area where wastes are eliminated. And then for my non-venomous snake, we'll draw one line down the middle. And then I'm gonna separate those lines off from there. Just like this. So that's my non-venomous snake tail. Now, we're gonna cut that out. And I have this um, pipe cleaner as my snake body. So I'm going to attach my head onto there and just wrap that around like that. 
So you have your snake head on one end. Then you're going to use your bag of Fruit Loops and you're gonna start to string your Fruit Loops. Take your time, I may finish before you. Um, you're gonna string your Fruit Loops in any pattern that you like to make a very unique non-venomous snake. And you just keep putting on your Fruit Loops. You want to make a pattern. You may want to make them all one color. We're just going to make a pretend snake. So when you have your Fruit Loops on your snake, as you like them, you're going to attach your non-venomous tail. So you're just going to Wrap that around there like that. And then you have got a reminder and also a snack of a non-venomous snake. So you'll always remember to look for that thumb-shaped head and those round eyeballs. But if you are out in nature, you do not wanna pick up snakes or wildlife because they can always bite or harm you. So we just wanna look from a distance and enjoy. So that is all I have about reptiles and all of the live animals that I have with me. Um, if there, there, excuse me, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take those. Did the animals you showed today have any names? So that's a good question. So our um, animal specialist here, our Backyard Wildlife Center curator, um, prefers us not to name the animals because they are for education and not pets and so that we don't get attached to the animals like our pets. So no, they don't have names um, and you're welcome to name them if you want to. Some of us have pet names for them, but no um, formal names. Good question. Not seeing any questions popping up in the chat. We do have uh, one participant here with us. But otherwise, I think I asked my questions. Ooh. Okay. Right, my coworker deal. has a question. She wants to know how many turtle species are in the Mid South area. Oh, goodness. Um, well, you've got me there. So um, you've got the Eastern box turtles that are going to be your upland turtle. Um, that's the tortoise species that we have. Um, and then your water turtles are, um, there are so many different species. I'm actually, um, Emmy is actually trying to get a, get a read on that for me. But um, in the lake, you have soft shell turtles, pond turtles, red-eared sliders, painted turtles, uh, snapping turtles, alligator snapping turtles. Um, I know I'm missing some different species of all of those, um, all here in the Mid-South in our lakes. Tennessee has 16 different turtle species just alone. Wonderful, thank you very much. Sure. Other than that, I think that's all I have on my end. Thank you so much you for do. joining us today. Absolutely. It was fun. Um, please feel free to email me with any extra questions. Will do. I hope you have the wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye now from Lichterman. Bye.